Welcome everyone to Couch Potato Diary. Happy Monday. My name is Peter Klein. Thank you very much for tuning in today. Coming up on the show, some madness in the NHL that kind of gets cut off. Uh, also, some madness in the Ultimate Fighting Championship. Uh, a crazy weekend in the Canadian Football League, and we get ready for a crazy weekend in professional wrestling. Plus, our NFL preview continues as uh, we are held accountable for last year's actions, and uh, it's another mock draft. So it is a very busy show. Thank you all so much for tuning in today. All right, we begin in the National Hockey League as the San Jose Sharks have ruined all of our fun. So to recap, the St. Louis Blues uh, gave offer sheets to two RFAs that the Edmonton Oilers have, Dylan Holloway and Philip Broberg. By no means um, cornerstone pieces of the Edmonton Oilers franchise, but players that you would rather have than not. And certainly players you would rather have than um, have them leave for nothing. But maybe not players you wanted to pay that amount of money to. So it's an interesting, weird dynamic that goes on there. And the Edmonton Oilers can't just match immediately because their salary cap, it, it, it sucks. So they were in a very difficult spot. And then fucking San Jose Sharks come in and just ruin all of our fun because the Sharks have acquired Cody Ceci from the Edmonton Oilers along with a third round pick in exchange for a defenseman who I guess played for Chris Knobloch somewhere and will probably factor in minimally to the Edmonton Oilers situation. Um, Ceci has a long track record of being kind of a fringe defenseman who is trusted um, in situations that are greatly beyond his skill set. And so to go out and acquire this player from Edmonton to bail them out to get this guy is so frustrating. Like the, 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 he is equal parts better than most of the defensemen the San Jose Sharks have, and also not a good NHL defenseman. And so to be like, no, we need to get that guy on our rebuilding roster right now for a third round pick um, and only be taking on a third round pick and bailing these guys out of the situation with the Blues is so incredibly frustrating. The Oilers were in a jam, and to get them out for just an extra third-round pick doesn't seem worth it to me. If I'm any other team, I'm like, ah, you know what? That first next year is looking pretty good, or that second next year is looking pretty good. That That is... I, I I just I can't imagine settling for just getting a third round pick to take on the final year of Cody CC's contract and needing to have Cody CC like best case scenario for the Sharks is they're able to flip him at the deadline to a team that thinks they're in it and thinks they're a 10th defenseman away from making a run. So I just I don't see the real upside gain here from the San Jose Sharks to just take this on for a third round pick now. Mike Greer, their general manager, does have ties to the Oilers organization. First off, he played there. We know that part. Secondly, uh, apparently his first job in management was uh, a scouting position under uh, Stan Bowman. And so, like, I, I guess that there was, like, a little bit of helping your guys out. But from a Sharks organizational standpoint, it doesn't help you to, to help the Edmonton Oilers. I don't think the Oilers are going to have the Sharks back in a trade somewhere down the road now because the, the Oilers um, were given options thanks to the San Jose Sharks. And so I, I just, I, I don't think this makes any sense. And I, I think, quite frankly, the reason that this took so long to do was probably everyone else in the Sharks front office was trying to hold Mike Greer back from the phone like the Avengers when they're trying to get Thanos's uh, Infinity Gauntlet off and there's just like guys they're pulling and Thanos is being put to sleep by Mantis and it's I watched this movie yesterday that's why the reference is so deep um and, and they're just like they're pulling on both arms and they're just about to get it off and then someone punched him in the face and he woke up um that's probably exactly literally blow for blow what happened like I, I just did this doesn't this doesn't make any sense out there. And look, I understand there is, especially for, for struggling teams. Um, and I obviously, um, based in Calgary, work on Calgary radio at times, um, work on Calgary YouTube at other times. Um, the flames, I, I think should be doing stuff like this, but this exact situation, it, it just, it doesn't really seem like the sharks are getting enough for what the Oilers actually needed in this situation. Like, Cody CC just taking on Cody CC's contract to the Sharks is probably just worth a third round pick. But when you're looking at what it means now for the Edmonton Oilers, I think it's worth significantly more than a first or than a third round pick to the Edmonton Oilers to be able to free up that space and make this move. So now what do the Oilers do? 
According to Puckpedia, uh, with the contracts matched, the Oilers are about $6 million in the hole. You can absolutely make the case for not keeping Broberg and and, and be fine. Um, it's a $4.5 million cap hit for a player who has spent exactly 0% of his NHL career looking like a $4.5 million player. That being said, he is 23 years old and could absolutely be a $7, 8000000 million player very, very soon. And so to lose that player from your organization for nada, I guess it's not technically nada. You get whatever the compensation is for um, uh, for an RFA of a contract that size. So you get something back for it. Um, but that still stings a little bit. And so that is where I, I think this is interesting because the, the Edmonton Oilers, traditionally not an organization swimming in defensive tap, uh, talent, sorry. Um, now they have Darnell Nurse, who is what he is, but I think a, a strong defenseman. Ekholm completely changed that organization and has got the most out of Bouchard. Um, but I do think you could have looked at this year and had a pairing of Nurse, Broberg, um, Ekholm, and um, e Ekholm and Bouchard, and then d d whoever you want on the uh, stretch, um, Stetcher, d Kulak, whoever. Um, and been very much okay with it. Like th th there is a world where you can get a lot out of a, a Philip Roberg. I, I would suggest even $4.5 million out of him, but there's also a world where he kind of just isn't it. Um, like the, he, he becomes the Timu version of uh, Evan Bouchard and never really quite clicks. And now for a team that is already paying too much on Darnell nurse, who is about to be paying a lot for um, Leon Dreisaitl and Connor McDavid, whilst also already paying them a lot. And then also on top of that, paying an extra to Evan Bouchard, you don't really want to waste $4.5 million if the guy isn't going to be that good. So it's an interesting call for Edmonton there. They also go out and acquire Vasily Pod Colson from the Vancouver Canucks um, earlier in the day. So that would potentially be your Dylan Holloway replacement. I personally would prefer Holloway over Pod Colson. There is absolutely some personal bias in there. I've I've, I've interviewed the kid. Um, I've called a couple of his games. So that like I, th there's a thing there. So that the, I could absolutely be having a bias there. But I do think that Holloway is a little bit further along than where Pod Colson is. Although both players in kind of similar spots in their organization where. Pretty talented, just can't really stick, um, but probably would get like 25 minutes a night on the San Jose Sharks. Um, so weird spots for them to, to to be in. And so you can kind of see the case to not really accept, uh, to, to not really match either of them. Um, but Edmonton now kind of has the, the cap situation where they can at least do it with one. And honestly, I would be attaching heaven and earth to an Evander Kane contract to try to get that one out of there. And then you can just keep both. And I, I think you feel pretty all right with that. And I like the team that they they have built if they're able to keep those guys around um, and, and let them kind of start to, to fill in in those roster spots. But no matter how this plays out, this was just fun. The offer sheets are there. So you may as well take advantage of it as much as you can. The fact that we only get this every few years is frustrating. And I'm not saying like go out and... Um and do this for random RFA fourth liner X, but there are pretty good players generally available in these spots. And I just put pressure on these teams to, to do it. And like, if the St. Louis Blues are willing to move, let's say Pavel Buchnevich, are the Edmonton Oilers just not going to want to make a trade with them because they did this? That would be very poor management. Like, yeah, you can get pissed at a team for doing it, but I like, in the long term, how much does it really affect um, what you're looking to do? Um, and, and so, like, th you can you can screw these up, you know, like the, there was the, the Jay Feaster, Ryan O'Reilly um, situation here a, a few years ago, several years ago now, that probably wouldn't have worked out great in the Flames' favor if that would have worked out. So it, it's not just a fail-safe 100% of the time, this thing is awesome, but it at least gets a little bit of buzz going. And look, like from a hockey standpoint, um, not that they're super focused on what I'm talking about, but th this got some buzz about the National Hockey League for a couple of weeks when it probably, or for a week anyway, where it probably wouldn't have had any anyway. Player movement is key when it comes to conversations and stuff like that so it, it, it's good for the league i think it's a I, I think an interesting way of team building and it puts pressure on other teams and makes them make some decisions so overall this was a really really fun week and it provides some interesting looks for edmonton at the end of the day if i'm edmonton i try to keep both i think there's something there in broberg and i really think there's something there in holloway and even if there isn't um broberg at 4.5 might be a little bit difficult to move but it's two years and you can eat some of it anyway um 
that can be a big piece in a trade that you're trying to make. Um, if nothing else, he can be a pretty good like salary matching type of a piece if you are trying to, to, to make some money work and, and something along those lines. Like if you are Edmonton and you're looking to bring in an $8 million player, well, now you have a very good trade chip and $4.5 million that you can kind of just shove into it and, and, and do that. And for a team that could be rebuilding, that would be an interesting piece to, to try to go out and, and move. Um, and Holloway, I just think he's going to be good. And for a team that was within a game of the Stanley Cup final, I just don't think you should be giving up good for draft picks right now. Um, and that, so I, I think Edmonton, like I said, I, I would try to move on from Kane. Um, they have moved on from CC career, but um, that, that would be the move that I would try to make. Uh, all right. It was a, an interesting weekend in the Canadian football league. Uh, let's shift from Canadian hockey teams to Canadian football teams. The CFL's most outstanding player for a couple of years ago has a bit of work to do after his week one debut. Nathan Rorick struggled in his debut against the Winnipeg Blue Bombers in a uh, tough loss for BC. So I think the moral of the story here, kids, is no matter how talented you are, maybe you need more than three practices, excuse me, with a team to get ready. Um, this team is actually quite a bit different than the one that they had a couple of years ago that he was able to, to really put on that type of a show with. And so I, I think like it made sense to give it a go. Right. And like I said, in, in, in the predictions, um, 75% of Nathan Rorick is better than most quarterbacks in this league. It just, we were further off from 75% of Nathan Rorick than I think we all, all thought. And my initial thought was, man, maybe they should have just kept Dolagala around for, for one more week. I don't think what we saw from Rorick was that much worse than, than Dolagala. Um, th this was just, it was a difficult matchup to go into. Um, Winnipeg's defense, we, we've talked about it here for a few weeks. Winnipeg's defense is actually quite good. Um, Tyrell Ford is a stud on that defensive unit. Um, Big Hill getting banged up hurts, but th this is still, I think, a good defensive football team. And they really put a lot of pressure on Rorick and, and he did not handle it all that well. I still think he's going to be fine. I still think the Lions are going to be fine, but you look at it now, um, he doesn't really have a whole lot of runway to be working with at this point. Uh, BC plays Ottawa on Saturday, so they get a bit of help there um, Sunday to Saturday. That That's not the worst turnaround you have in the CFL. Um, riders are going Friday to Thursday with a facing a team that was on a bye. Uh, Winnipeg plays on Friday. So um, th there are certainly worse turnarounds. They get that one, but BC now, all of a sudden, they are in second place in the West um, and are a bad week of results away from being in fourth because Winnipeg and Calgary are right behind them. And so the pressure is on Nathan Rorick immediately to go out there and try and get the job done. Um, but the West man is so crazy. Like um, there are two teams in the West who have a positive point differential right now. Does anyone want to take a guess at who that may be? I'll give you one. It's the team with the Lucha mask right there. Um, in the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. The other one's Edmonton. Aside from that, Calgary is, uh, quick math, dash 44. Um, oh, sorry, Winnipeg is ahead. Sorry, apologies, apologies, apologies. Winnipeg is plus 11 after this week. Uh, but BC's dash 15, um, and Saskatchewan is plus 11. So, um, it's kind of wild that... That's a that's where the West is, uh, but B that's where BC is like that. This should be a dominant team and they just aren't right now. Um, but with Nathan Rorick at the helm, you do think that they'll get back on track facing a good Ottawa team that has some pressure on them. Chad Kelly is coming back now. Uh, we'll get to that in a second here, but they have a bit of pressure on them this week. I just an overall thing. I don't get why teams are so timid about going forward on third down in the Canadian Football League, and I feel like they use the oh well the clock's different as an excuse to just punt the football away with a minute and a half to go um in, in a game like oh well did what we could took the 28 seconds off of the clock good for us um the field's huge in the cfl and teams like just give you a yard right like we have teams on second and two doing quarterback sneaks and getting it um and, and so like third and three third and four you should be able to draw up a play that gets you something open in that area and can help keep drives going. I think teams are way, way too content to just, well, it's the CFL. You get like eight possessions in the final three minutes. 
we, we just have to run the ball up the middle and there we go. Like that, that just seems like such an antiquated way of thinking about things. Um, and defenses are ready for it. Like I, Saskatchewan was a prime example of it this week where I, I thought they were way too conservative on third down and that ends up costing them a game. Now, so does their field goal kicker going three for seven and their best receiver making some bad drops. But um, I just think that you can be way more in control of those situations and for a league that will give up points for field position constantly when it comes to to punts and and not booting them into the end zone and trying to down them at like the one or two or or even just inside the 10 um or inside the 20 in, in some cases to have that but then also be very conservative well all right i guess we have to just run it up the middle on back-to-back -back plays where we can only kill 20 seconds of the clock off i just i find it weird that the nfl way of killing the clock where you run the ball up the middle a few times and just hope for the best um, sticks around, but you don't follow the NFL model of like being a bit more aggressive and just trying to um, extend some drives and okay, well, if there is still three or four possessions left in this game, then why are we abandoning the pass and just going with a very predictable run when we can limit this and now just control the football? So I, I think that teams need to be significantly more, aggressive on on third downs in just as a, a general league and i think you could get um I, I think you could get a coach that could come in and be a bit more aggressive and actually really change how this thing works so that that was just something i noticed but um this isn't so much the week coming up um or, or the the week that was more the week coming up chad kelly is back um, and just like, personally, I'm not a huge fan of it. If there was an issue, it probably should have been longer than nine games. Um, and if there wasn't, he should have been playing all season long. The last chance clause is really, really interesting. Like, I, I don't think a non-star gets that. Like a, a left tackle isn't coming in and getting, okay, well, this is your last chance. They're probably just done. Um, and so like, it, it just, from, from everything that you, you kind of see for how he has carried himself in this whole thing. It doesn't seem like there is an ounce of remorse. And it, it, if there is, he needs to express it and it needs to, I, I think, express what whatever he did that got him suspended was wrong because like, obviously something happened or else he wouldn't have been suspended. Um, so I, I think there needs to be an acknowledgement like, hey, what I did was wrong. Um, and these are the ways that I am growing and learning from it instead of, oh, it's a second chance. Everyone, everyone, what did, would you not want a second chance? Everyone deserves a second chance. Um, I think you need to show that you deserve that second chance by proving that you learned what went wrong with the first one. Right. So, um, hopefully he comes out and very eloquently puts what, um, what, what, what went wrong and what has, um, what, what he needs to change. But until then, like, I just, I don't like it. I, I just don't like it. Now, from a purely football standpoint, this is a major boost. The Argos have been dreadful to watch offensively all season long, but are still just three points back of Ottawa for a home playoff game. If he can make this average, uh, this offense even just average, then this, with how this defense is playing, it's a major step in the right direction. And they have a lot of weapons that have not been maximized with Dukes and with Arbuckle out there. Kelly at least can do that. And that gives the defense a bit of time to be able to kind of build some things up and at least get a bit of rest. So I, I, I think, again, from a football standpoint, it's massive for Toronto. From a, a personal standpoint, a lot of work needs to be done for me to be okay with, with this whole entire situation. So that's a story from the Canadian Football League. We'll get the football back up and running a little bit later on when uh, we continue our NFL preview at the end of the show. Uh, but right now, let's shift gears and get ready for pro wrestling's one of the biggest shows of the year in pro wrestling. Um, as AEW presents All In from Wembley Stadium. What are some of the early things I'm working on and, and looking for? Let's talk about it. AEW All In goes down this weekend from Wembley Stadium in England. Uh, in the main event, it is Swerve Strickland defending the AEW World Championship against Brian Danielson. Um, this feud has been tremendous. I I think it has brought out the best in both performers and really brought out like it's it's really highlighted the best aspects of where these performers are at in their career with Danielson 
fighting for one last chance and also like his quest to help the next generation out and Swerve Strickland looking to take that from him, but not just his, his wrestling career that we all know he holds so dear, but also try to be like, yeah, and, and this push to extend your legacy by helping out the next generation, it ain't shit. I'm going to beat up on Wheeler Yuta. You've done nothing. And now you're just going to fade away. I, I think it is tremendous work from both of these men. And look, I thought having Hangman as the guy in this world title match um, at Wembley Stadium was the perfect kind of blow off to this whole thing. Um, but I, I think you've got an amazing storyline out of all of this. And now you still have Hangman Swerve in your back pocket that you can do whenever. Um, and it has... Uh, I, I think it's elevated swerve. It's uh, not that Danielson needed elevating, but boy, has he looked good. And now you have this intrigue kind of hanging over the whole thing of what does Hangman Adam Page actually do? And that can set you up for pay-per-views further on down the line. Um, in the tag team title match, it will be the Young Bucks defending against FTR and the Acclaimed. And I think the Acclaimed have done a good job of kind of evolving and really stepping up and getting into a more serious tone with these characters. I have a, a scissor me daddy ass shirt um, in my closet. Um, like th this is uh, th this is a group that I have loved for basically their entirety. They they have been just a blast to to, to watch and to enjoy. Um, but I do think there needed to be a bit of an evolution in their characters. And I think it starts with um, Blood and Guts. And now it has been able to evolve into this more serious role that this team is taking on. And so that has been really great to see. It should be a really interesting match now with them, the the, the Bucks and FTR. Um, admittedly, Bucks and FTR is getting a little bleh. And while I have liked the acclaimed, that the setup for this has been a little blah to me, um, which is something you can say for a few of these, quite frankly. But um, th th I think it's going to be a great match. And I, I love this evolution from the acclaimed. And I think it's going to be a tricky balancing act to kind of keep the parts of the characters that we liked um, and kind of stay true to this character, to these characters and to this group, but while also developing that edge and, and moving forward with that. Um, in the, uh, in another match that has my attention, it's Mercedes Monet against Britt Baker. This one was stunted a little bit. Britt Baker got suspended. And so Monet had to carry the whole thing. And it just, it hasn't gotten into the next gear that I think it could have. Um, Mercedes Monet is maybe not necessarily the, the performer that, um, a, a lot of people, I, I shouldn't even say that. It's just not a character and it's just not a promo style that have clicked. I think she is quite good. Um, but I, I think she is quite good. Like specifically, she's a very good wrestler. Um, and I, I think it is more produced packages and stuff that help build her. And because she has been the only one in this feud, she has had to do the, the grunt work in front of the crowds as well. And so that has, I, I think, kind of limited this. But again, the match is going to be fantastic. The build hasn't been all that great, um, which I, I think is just the tagline for AEW at this point. Um, and But I, I will say, Camille Brickhouse being added to it is a really fun wrinkle. Kind of being the, the diesel to Mercedes' is Shawn Michaels and building her up that way. Um, Camille, I, I got to ring announce for her when I, I, I kind of returned to ring announcing uh, with Wild Rose wrestling about this time last year um great professional phenomenal in the ring um an amazing look as well and i, I think a real great addition to, to this overall package and i think provides a, a fun wrinkle for what should be a great match uh but when we're talking about great matches i think one is probably going to steal the show and that will be mjf against will osprey for the, the united states international championship um this match is going to be incredible the, the first one exceeded all expectations, and now this one will be expected to top that. I'm not sure how they're going to do it, um, but I, I think it'll be interesting. I think we have seen a real edge in Will Ospreay. I, I think his character work since coming over to AEW has been brilliant, um, and some of the stuff with Kyle Fletcher. The, the Daniel Garcia thing felt a little forced, um, but the, the Kyle Fletcher part of it to, to get to that point was really great. I don't love that MJF is doing the, the real American gimmick, quite frankly. Um, I, I think he is just better than that. And so to, to do that, like you stop what would have been like some support behind this guy anyway. Um, but like doing the real American gimmick as a, a heel thing in the States is weird. And like, he's good enough to pull it off, but it just, it feels very cheap for me. It feels like something you would give someone who isn't 
as good of a character as MJF is. And so hopefully this is an evolution that is very quick and, and you don't really have to deal with uh, for, for a whole lot, but the match is going to be great. Overall, I think it's been an all right build. Um, AEW has been hitting their stride in a few areas over the last little bit. There are still some classic AEW storyline problems and things of that nature. The, 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 the young bucks being in charge, but not being totally in charge. Like it feels like they're kind of halfway on both and it hasn't, it hasn't made that story click. And then the, the fallout from blood and guts where it's just like, okay, well they didn't like Jack Perry on fire. So he gets a title match now. Um, that has been, that, that, that's been all right, but it just, it feels like there has been some issues with that. And, and with a, a few of the stories where it's just like, and, and, and now they're having a match. Cool. Um, but overall, this is going to be a fantastic show coming up this weekend. I, uh, barring something unforeseen, uh, I should be able to watch this one live. And so we're hoping to get a, uh, a, a quick post show up once the show is done this weekend. Uh, so that's going to be, um, that, that's going to be what we're doing here for, for all in, but we're going to have some coverage here throughout the week as well. All right, let's shift gears and talk about the ultimate fighting championship as UFC 305 is now in the books and the title picture stays the same at 185 pounds. <laughs> UFC 305 is now done, and Drikas Duplessy gets the job done as he submits Israel Adesanya in the fourth round. Uh, we're going to be hitting on just kind of the main stories for the main event here. Later on today, there's going to be a full main card recap of UFC 304. Sorry, UFC 305 with, with all the, the different uh, fight breakdowns and stuff like that. Uh, but for, for this, for just the, the kind of flagship show here, we're just going to focus on kind of the big stories coming out of it. And that is Drake's duplicy. Yes, it's unorthodox at times, uh, but it can be effective. It, um, I had him down on my scorecard going into the fourth round. He came out with a big punch, a takedown and a choke closes the show. Um, and so it is effective. Um, it's not pretty, but it, it's not what it was 10, 15 years ago where, where you would have like, oh, you don't know what angle it's coming from. And it, it's just like, it's, it's all awkward. It, it's not the most fluid and you're probably not teaching the, the Drickus Duplessy fighting style, um, at, at gyms across North America and the world. Um, but there is a surprising amount of technique in it as well. Um, it, it's just, it, it's very, very strange. Um, but it, it's tough to deal with because there is power that comes with it. And like I said, there's a bit of technique. Like it's, he'll charge in and he's just like, like Homer, where if, if I hit you, I'm, it's not my fault. Um, and then he'll stop and he'll hit the most technical fucking two punch combo up the middle that you've seen. And it'll rock him. Um, and he'll, he'll put that pressure on, but he'll do it in a way that'll open up an opportunity and he'll drill you with a left and he'll pounce immediately and just get the, the choke. The takedowns are weird. Yes, I, I will grant you that, where they basically just look like a pro wrestling flying cross body block. Um, but it again, it still works. And now it's three straight wins against three former champions in Robert Whitaker, Sean Strickland, and now Israel Adesanya. So you can say all the technique stuff you want. This is a great run. And he is very deserving of holding that championship at 185 pounds. And so I think now what's next for both is really interesting. Um, DDP calling for a super fight with Alex Pereira. I, I'd rather see Pereira move up in heavyweight than fight the 185 pound champion. Um, but th there isn't really that obvious next intriguing contender at 185 pounds. And I, I don't think you can go immediate rematch for Izzy because he's now lost three of his last four. So what, what what could be next for these guys? It will probably be just like a, a challenger that feels a bit like a mandatory for um for for Drickus Duplessis. Um and, and for Israel Adesanya, like 205 doesn't seem like an option after um he kind of got bullied around by Jan Blahovitz. Um the, the fight to make at 205 would be a bout with Alex Pereira, but you've lost three of four. It's tough to now shoehorn you into a title fight in a division where you are um Owen or uh, yeah, Owen one in. So th there isn't really an obvious thing. Um, th the thing with him though, is that he's still very good. And look, I had him winning that fight right up until he wasn't. So he he's not cooked or anything. Um, it's just, I, I don't know where you go from here with him. Like there is a rematch you could do with, um, with, with Duplessis, quite frankly, there's a rematch you could do with Sean Strickland as well. Um, and, and try to work Izzy up that way. But like this, I, I know the UFC doesn't do tune up fights. But this is the case for the UFC doing tune-up fights. And I understand um, it is weird to suggest like basically a pro wrestling squash match where it's real and you are now 
inflicting a great amount of punishment on another human being to get another guy back to, to where they want. But they do it in boxing all the time. Um, and it's also like it's it's a tremendous opportunity for someone not in the top 15 in middleweight. Like just give Izzy someone, I don't want to say like off the contender series or whatever, but give someone, give Izzy like a top 30 fight, put it on, um, put it on ABC as like a fight night card and just in a let's get this guy right and get him back on track sort of a way and then you continue to build up a start the ufc has never done it um and i i don't hate that they don't do it i just think there are some times where it maybe makes some sense where you have like a, a situation here with izzy where he has lost three of his last four um and you just kind of you, you don't want to keep feeding him to the wolves and have it seem like it's over so go out, give him maybe a bit more of a softer landing spot and either A, he's cooked and he loses to that guy and now all of a sudden you've created another star to that or you have an opportunity now to, to continue to build Izzy's career that way. So that that's just, I, I think there is a bit of a case for sometimes the Ultimate Fighting Championship going the tune-up route. Uh, so we'll see. Um, like I said, we're going to have a full UFC 305 main card breakdown um, coming out a little bit later on today. Um, and we are also, throughout the week, going to have some more post-UFC 305 coverage. Going to be looking at uh, pound for pound rankings. I'm going to debut a new UFC segment coming up uh, probably on Thursday here. And then Friday, we're going to look at the fights to make for all the key fighters coming off of UFC 305. Uh, but now it's time to shift gears and get ready for the start of the NFL season. And um, I always start our season previews looking uh, back at what happened last year and what we can learn from last season. And so the other day we did, what can we learn from the Kansas city chiefs and how they were built today? Uh, it's our accountability as I look at uh, what went right and what went wrong in NFL and fantasy picks last season. So let's get into it. Our NFL 2024 preview continues on here. Uh, today is the last day we are looking back to last season and what we can learn from that. The rest of it is all looking forward. And so today uh, is the NFL accountability episode where I go over what I got right, what I got wrong from the, the main picks from last year. We're not going to go over every team, but we are going to do some of the fantasy stuff and some of the other segment things that I, um, that, that I did. So, um, we will start with overvalued and undervalued. We'll start with overvalued. Uh, the, the main one there was the New York Jets. And now injuries helped us out a ton. I, I will grant you that. But that was part of why we thought that the Jets were overvalued. You have an old quarterback. Um, I thought Aaron Rodgers was kind of cooked anyway. And so I kind of missed out on a full season of rightness. But still, that is one of the risks you take with a 40-something-year-old quarterback is injuries can happen. And sometimes it's four and a half minutes into a season. So I will gladly take the W on that. We thought the, the, the Saints were overvalued at nine and a half. We just got the win there. Um, and kind of the same reasons we thought they were overvalued last year, we think they're going to be uh, that again this year. Um, Minnesota, we thought overvalued at uh, eight and a half. I... And, and again, now some of those same situations kind of popping up this year, uh, again, where I thought the defense took a pretty substantial step back and I didn't know how good Kirk Cousins was going to be. Now, didn't know his leg was going to explode, um, but I, I still thought that there was a bit of a horseshoe from what happened two years ago. Um, and then going into to last year, I thought there was going to be a bit more regression than the market had built in. Carolina over seven and a half. Um, I think you're going to find we do this again with the number one overall pick. Um, I thought they were overvalued. I thought that there was way too much just, oh yeah, Bryce Young will come in and fix everything. And then you look at the rest of the roster and, oh, well, it sucks. Um, and so that one felt pretty easy. Denver over eight and a half. We just get the win there. Um, admittedly, I thought that one, when I saw I had that down before I went back to the standings, I was like, oh man, we crushed that one. I didn't realize Denver had got to eight wins on the season. So, um, but maybe another team we might look at in this category again coming up in a little bit from a fantasy standpoint, Cooper cup at seventh overall thought was way overvalued. Um, there was just it, it, a couple of these him and Tony Pollard, everyone and Najee Harris, quite frankly, everyone was drafting at best case scenario. And, um, for Pollard, that regression hit like a house, um, Najee Harris, he finishes his RB 20. So that's a win for us as well. Um, Cooper cup, he gets hurt. Um, and it, but again, that's a risk factor that gets baked in with a, a old receiver, um, or older receiver, I should say. Um, and that one stung for me because I have him in fantasy football um, on, in a very deep, very competitive keeper league. And so that made it a, a bit challenging this season. But um, it, it just it felt like all three of those guys were a little bit overvalued. The two that we got wrong in uh, overvalued and I'm not just looking at what I got right. I promise you. Um, but it was Travis Etienne and uh, Jameer Gibbs. Etienne uh, finishing RB or I, I thought um, at RB 12 was way overvalued. I thought I just didn't think he was that good. 
and Tank Bisbee was going to come in and steal all that work. And um, instead, ETN was amazing. Um, Tank fumbled a bunch, and it was ETN's backfield all season long. And so that was just a, a, a misevaluation of the talent by me on ETN. And for Gibbs, we thought that the, the opportunities just maybe weren't going to be there with David Montgomery. And I also kind of thought Detroit was overvalued in general all season long. Um, Gibbs does finish as the RB10. I will say for about 10 weeks, I was right on this, uh, but just didn't quite get there. Undervalued now. Uh, we have the Titans undervalued at seven and a half. That's obviously a loss. Um, I, I thought because of the injuries that they had two years ago, that there was going to be just a, a full bounce back and it just never really got there. Um, we did get Seattle right at eight and a half. Um, people, uh, I think, were just ready for Gino to fall off one more time. And um, while well, he kind of did, the rest of the team was quite good. The Chargers, we had them way undervalued. Last year was just a season from hell from there. Um, and so... I, I maybe should have learned to, to not trust that team, but I did. And then we had a couple week one plays Cincinnati minus four against Cleveland. That was a big loss. Um, and Philadelphia minus four and a half against the Patriots. They won by five. So we got that one right. Uh, and now in our season preview portion of it, uh, Miami over nine and a half. That was a win Miami to win the division. That was a loss. Again, that looked like a win for about 15 weeks of the season. And then Tua just fell off, but that, that one, it was all well with Tua, Tua was one hit away from getting hurt. So yeah, it's football, man. Shows everybody. Um, and I, I think there might be a little bit of that baked into to how I view this season as well. Um, the New York Jets to miss the postseason. That one was a, a big win. We kind of discussed it before. Uh, Baltimore over 10 and a half and to win the division. Um, very much believers in Baltimore last year. So we got a couple of wins there. Tennessee, we already went over it. We went over seven and a half and to win uh to win the division. That was uh strike one and strike two. But Jacksonville under nine and a half and to miss the playoffs. W W on that. Um and, and there's I might have changed my tune on that. Um, I'm still doing a bit more of my NFL research, but as it goes along, they're a team that I'm, I'm getting there a little bit more and more. I, I kind of go back and forth on. The Houston Texans under uh, six and a half. That one was a gigantic L. Uh, we got that one entirely wrong. Uh, we already discussed Chargers um, over nine and a half. Got that one wrong. Kansas City under 11 and a half, but to win the AFC. Nailed that one absolutely perfectly uh denver under eight and a half was a win the raiders under eight and a half was a win as well uh although very very actually was that a win i have that marked down as a win but did the i thought they finished nine and eight maybe they were eight and nine last year um but either way that one was not as close as we thought it was going to be after um after the start of the season they do finish eight and nine um, so we did get that one right, but that, that one was supposed to be a lock for a bit. We had Philadelphia going to the Super Bowl. That was a miss green Bay over seven and a half. That was a win that I remember that that was based off of look, Aaron Rodgers got this team to over seven and a half wins last year. And he wasn't that good. So even if Jordan love sucks, there's still going to be some progression there. Now we had them to win the division and that was a loss. And we thought Detroit under nine and a half and to miss the playoffs. Um, and that was a loss. Our biggest win of the year was Tampa Bay over six and a half and to win the division. Um, that was just kind of recognizing how bad the rest of the division was and just how evenly matched everyone there was. And so there might be a lesson to take from that. We will see. Uh, Carolina under seven and a half. We got that one right. Seattle um, over eight and a half. Um, it's weird. I have that one as a win in one spot and as a loss in another. Um, I may have got that wrong when looking at overvalued, undervalued. You know, they finished at nine and eight. So that's a, that's a win in this spot. Um, so we we do get that one. Um, correct. And then we went Arizona under three and a half, just getting a loss there. So the lessons, um, injuries helped us quite a bit with Aaron Rodgers. Um, I, I guess that one specifically was, I, I guess the chargers as well. Um, they, 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 they maybe hurt us a little bit as well. I think we tried to go too hard against the grain on the Detroit lions. Um, although it worked out on Jacksonville uh, as well. Um, I, I thought we did a good job of kind of targeting who the bad teams were going to be. Didn't quite pinpoint or nail some of the, the good teams as well as I, I, I would have hoped. Um, but, but overall, I, I think a pretty good season last year. Um, but, but like I said, some lessons to take from that. Um, I, I think that sometimes narratives really start to build and that like the, the, the unknown of Jordan love, well, it's a drop from Aaron Rodgers. Well, 
how could they possibly? And the the Tua situation where like, well, it's one hit away. What are they going to do? Um, and, and so I, I think there is a little bit of value in going against some of those narratives some of the time. Uh, all right, that is going to do it for that portion of the NFL preview. We're going to have a lot more looking at this upcoming season in the next little bit. Um, but right now we are going to shift gears and continue our fantasy football preview as we have another mock draft. This time, mock draft number six. All right, uh, it is time for another mock draft. So if you're new around here, uh, we are doing mock drafts from uh, all 12 spots in a 12-team half-point PPR. Um, going to do a couple other ones uh, throughout the, the, the season, but this is how we prepped for, for last fantasy season. It went pretty well, so we're doing it again. So um, wherever you are consuming this, the first five uh, mock drafts are up now, um, so check those out. But uh, let's get into it now and do one here from pick number six, the halfway point. Uh, all right, we will hit okay, and we will get going. So first, uh, Tyree Kill, C.D. Lamb, Justin Jefferson, Christian McCaffrey comes off the board fourth, followed by Jamar Chase, and now it is our turn. And so when we look at who is available here, uh, B. John Robinson is uh, the, the top back available, uh, top player available according to ADP, followed by uh, Brees Hall, uh, also available at running back, Jonathan Taylor, Jameer Gibbs, Saquon Barkley. At wide receiver, it's Amon Ross St. Brown, A.J. Brown uh, as well, uh, Garrett Wilson, Puka Nakua, Marvin Harrison, uh, Drake London and Devonte Adams uh, are the ones here. Bijan feels like the the, the easy pick. Um, you, you could certainly make a case for Brees Hall as well, uh, but in this spot we are going to go Bijan Robinson uh, with our spot. And so immediately Brees Hall goes right after that, followed by the the two Browns and uh, Wilson. Kyron Williams at the back half of the first round. That seems just way too expensive for me. Uh, Puka Nakua, uh, Jameer Gibbs. Uh, at the turn there, uh, then Jonathan Taylor, Drake London, Marvin Harrison, Devonte Adams, and Saquon Barkley. And so we are here now uh, with Travis Etienne um, at, at running back. Uh, we also have Derrick Henry available, Devon Achan, uh, and Josh Jacobs. At quarterback, Josh Allen is up there. Uh, and then a wide receiver, it is Olave, Ayuk, Debo Samuel, and Mike Evans. We have been getting Debo a fair amount in these drafts. This one, it feels a, a little bit high to, to get. Um... I'm going to try something here because like as, as much as I, I, I appreciate that I was wrong on ETN a season ago, I, I still don't know if I want him just locked in as one of my top two picks. So I am going to go with the quarterback, Josh Allen. We've been waiting on quarterback right around the, the Kyler Murray time. Um, let's see what it looks like when we do take Josh Allen with our, uh, with our second round pick and just see what these drafts look like at the quarterback spot. Uh, so ETN Olave, Henry go after us along with... Um, uh, HN, uh, Laporta and Kelsey. So a couple of tight ends come off Pacheco Jacobs, Debo Samuel does come right off of the board. And so immediately we see maybe a flaw in our plan, uh, because Jalen Hurts is right there. And so is Patrick Mahomes. And so is Lamar Jackson. And so if you're going to go quarterback early, maybe it feels like uh, round three is the, the way to go. Mike Evans w would be a fine start at wide receiver number one, uh, along with Nico Collins, Jalen Waddell, uh, Stephon Diggs, DJ Moore. There's also Malik Neighbors, DK Metcalf, Cooper Cup, and uh, Michael Pittman all available. But uh, not a ton for, for, for running backs uh, in this spot. Honestly, James Cook is probably the most tempting in this area. Um, and then admittedly, like after this, it does kind of fall a little bit. So, man, it, it feels weird to just pass up wide receiver already. Like at this point, we've most drafts we've had two, uh, but we're going to keep passing it up. Uh, we're going to go zero WR in this one. Uh, and we are going to go with one who I think is going to be a major breakout this year in James Cook. And so we got that, we, we got that Buffalo offense that everyone's so excited about immediately after us, uh, goes Diggs Collins. We got a couple quarterbacks in Lamar Jackson and Jalen hurts coming off the board. Patrick Mahomes comes off as well. Um, and now it comes back around to us here in round number four. Now there are a few running backs that are available. So I, I think already we've made a couple tactical errors here. Um, I think we went around too early on Allen and maybe we went around too early with, there with cook. Um, so maybe like getting probably Nico Collins would have been the play for me. Um, Mike Evans in that spot as well. And then come back here now with Joe Mixon as our RB two. I think that would have been a, a pretty good spot to, to get that Cooper cup. I'm worried about that offense. I'm and specifically Matthew Stafford going down with an injury. Um, 
Zay Flowers, uh, I think, is a fine pick. Tang Dell, I, I think, is all right as well. Um, oh, sorry, I forgot to, to push this up. So um, there you see the top four, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, the, the top four that are available in uh, half-point PPR. And so we're in a tricky spot here right now because there, there isn't a whole lot of receivers that I love, um, but it does start to, to fall off here. And so it feels like we need to get one of them. Um even if there's an injury at quarterback, Cup, I think, can be fine. Um, it's just if there's an injury to him, I get a little bit worried. Uh, but we are going to go Cooper Cup in this spot. Immediately after a couple of tight ends go, with Mark Andrews and Trey McBride, um, CJ Stroud goes as well. One of the RBs comes off the board in Kenneth Walker. Another quarterback and another tight end in Kincaid come off. So again, we're in a spot where like Joe Mixon is right there for us. Um, th that just feels like such a great pick here in this spot. But we are getting to the point where I'm losing my safety net at tight end, and I, I want to get that. So we're going to go George Kittle here um, at, at the tight end spot, get that one really kind of locked in. I, I just, I don't want to be playing around in the mid to late part of tight end all season long. And, and Kyle Pitts does come off of the board in that spot. Uh, Joe Mixon went a couple picks after us. And so it loops back around. In my mind, I'm thinking we need to get a receiver. The, the best available right now is Keenan Allen. Um, and looking at the players here, th this is kind of why we've waited on quarterback to this point. Because there's no one in this area that really jumps out to me as I need to get this guy. Um, but when we look at the, the top four available, Keenan Allen, DeAndre Swift, uh, Ramondre Stevenson, and Roma Dunze. I don't need the third best wide receiver in Chicago um, in, in this spot. And the other ones like Xavier Worthy could be great, but this feels like a wild overpay. Um, Chris Godwin, I, I have worries about him maybe falling off a little bit. Evan Ingram isn't for me. So this is where Kyler has kind of been the play. And so this, to me, does really validate not waiting too long on quarterback, but waiting on quarterback and, and getting to this point. So while we are here, we are kind of stuck. Um... I've been getting this guy the whole time. I still think he's going to have a role in this Miami offense. I'm going Raheem Mostert um, with our selection here in the sixth round. After that, Dak comes off the board. Um, for running backs, it's DeAndre Swift, Ramondre Stevenson, Najee Harris, and Zamir White. Um, Jonathan Brooks comes off as well. For receivers, it was just Allen Rice and Adunze that came off of the board. And so looking at it now, we have um, Ingram, Worthy, Godwin, and Ridley as our top players available. After that, Tony Pollard is the, the best running back available, followed by Nick Chubb, um, Zach Moss, Javante Williams, Jalen Warren uh, being questionable, stings uh, a little bit. That That's a player that we've kind of been targeting as this has gone along. Um, now that we're here into the seventh round, we still only have the one right wide receiver. And so I feel like at this point, it, it's come to the area where taking a shot on Xavier Worthy, I, I don't think is absolutely devastating. We have built up our depth in other areas, so we feel all right about where we are at with Xavier Worthy. Um, you guys know if you've been watching, there are players that I am targeting now um, in, in around these areas, and most of them are wide receivers. Um, and just for, for those who haven't been watching, um, it is Christian Watson, Jackson Smith and Jigba, and Jamison Williams. Uh, we have also been targeting Brian Williams in this area. Um, and so th those are a couple of very tempting plays right now. Um, even though like ADP, I, I feel like I could get one of them, but this is a spot where I, I think like, I just, I don't love any of the other, uh, other options that are available. Nick Chubb, if he's great, could be a league winner. Um, Zach Moss might get some volume and some touchdowns, but I don't love it. Javonta Williams, that actually may not be a bad pick actually. Um, but I just, I, I really like these wide receivers, and so that's why we can go a little bit RB heavy in the beginning and wide receiver light in the back part is because I do think once you get down to around 8, 9, 10th round, there are some guys that we can get that we feel comfortable with. So we're going to go with Watson. Um, Moss comes off the board, Deontay Johnson. Um, you have Benson. There, Javante Williams goes at the beginning of the ninth. So we didn't necessarily get the guy who we wanted there. Um, but as it swings back around to us, Austin Eckler is available. Um, and so that... That makes it a little bit tempting, but the, the guy we really do want in, in this area 
it has been Jackson Smith and Jigba. As I've been thinking about it more, Jamison Williams is creeping up in my mind a little bit, but we are still going to go Jackson Smith and Jigba in this spot. And maybe Williams can swing back around to us. Um, Eckler and Robinson both come off the board. Robinson was one I was kind of hoping, and there goes um, Jamison Williams. So it was probably pie in the sky to think that we could get both or, or all three, I guess, in this spot. Um, Would have been nice, but we don't quite lock it down. Now, here's a spot that there are a couple of running backs who I am interested in here. Um, Jerome Ford, I think, had or is going to have a fair amount of the backfield in Cleveland this year, and I actually think he was quite good. Um, so I, I think that's an interesting play. And Chase Brown, um, admittedly, I heard Chris Harris talking him up the other day. Chase, Bra uh, Chase Brown was a player that I, I wouldn't hate getting in this spot now. And so there's a few running backs that, that are starting to creep up. The wide receivers have fallen off. This is where I think we now build up our running back depth. I'm still going to go with Jerome Ford here. Um, maybe it swings back around, but Ford is definitely the, the one that I want to come away with. Chase Brown. So again, uh, team one, we might try to work out a trade at some point because they got a couple of the receiver, the, the running backs that we like. Um, and then after this, it, it, it's kind of auto pick for me. Um, with Zach Charbonnet here in the 11th round. I think people are really underestimating the amount of volume that he is going to get in this offense this year. And so Zach Charbonnet is definitely the, the pick to click for me in the 11th round. And now after this, there have been a couple of occasions where we've looked at our defense and our kickers. Uh, when you look at what's available here still, there's four rounds left. A um, couple more tight ends come off the board. Aaron Rodgers coming off the board here in the 12th. Um, and so best players available right now. Joshua Palmer, Jerry Judy, and Rashid Shahid uh, for wide receivers. At quarterback, it is Kirk Cousins, Matthew Stafford. Um, at running back, it's Rico Dowdle, Ty Chandler, Marshawn Lloyd, and, and Tyler Algier. There's just nothing that's really jumping off to me. And so I think I can get ahead of things on the defensive side. Um... We will go with the New York Jets defense here and, and lock that one. And you can go San Francisco as well. I don't think there's a wrong play there, which is why maybe it's the smarter move to wait another round. But looking at what went off the board between that pick and now ours, uh, Shahid, Judy, Palmer, Lloyd out of Green Bay. Downs is the one in Indy where it's like, oh man, that one might have been nice. Uh, but I just don't trust that offense this year. Uh, Brandon Cooks, Matthew Stafford, Rico Dowdle, Tyler Algier, and then the 49ers defense. We are still going to wait the, 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 the 15th round. Um, maybe even the 14th to, to get our kicker. Um, but now looking at what is left, Kirk Cousins, um, best quarterback available by a ton. Uh, receivers, Gabe Davis, Jahan Dotson, Jalen Polk, Ricky Persall, and Troy Franklin. At running back, Ty Chandler and Antonio Gibson are still available in these spots. Um, you, you have to scroll down a ways to, to get some of the other guys who are kind of popping up. Um, but I, I think Polk is interesting. It sounds like that offense maybe isn't going to be as dumpster fiery, and he is a player where if it doesn't look like it's working in week one, I can just drop and it's fine. Um, and so maybe to get ahead of the kicker thing, we go here in the 14th round, because uh, again, there just aren't a whole lot of guys who I'm uh, clamoring for position player-wise, and even now, there are guy, a bunch of kickers coming off of the board. Um, and so we'll go... Uh, yeah, let's go Jake Moody for San Francisco. Keep that kicker run rolling. Um, and then we will get our final player here with our last selection as the kicker and defense run continues to go along. So it comes to us. Kirk Cousins is still available, um, which honestly, like not the worst. If we, if we hadn't gone Josh Allen, uh, Kirk Cousins uh, as a pick that's available, uh, I think is interesting. Um, there's a cup. There isn't a whole lot here, to be perfectly frank with you. Um, so I'm gonna go Khalil Herbert. Um, he, he's been getting an interesting amount of volume with Chicago in this preseason, and it, it feels like they're saving him up and using Swift more. And so you can read into that. And also, I think Herbert is actually good. And so I, I think getting a talented running back here in the 15th round is a pretty good. Thing. And so the uh, the, the draft concludes with uh, defenses aplenty. And so let's see. We, we we took a bit of a risk. We we changed up the strategy a little bit. How do we like our team? Our starting quarterback is Josh Allen. Our running backs are Bijan Robinson and James Cook. That is an excellent one too. We have Raheem Mostert uh, as our third, which uh, I think in terms of a flex play is fine. Um, our receivers are Cooper Cup, Xavier Worthy. And then it's Christian Watson, Jackson Smith, and Jigba, uh, and Jalen Polk. So actually didn't end up too bad if we're right on Watson and, and Smith and Jigba, or if Worthy hits. So we're, we're honestly not in that bad of a spot, um, given how early we went on quarterback. I still think, um, for, for those watching on YouTube, like this area here, this 5th, 6th, 7th, is kind of the, the, the neighborhood I want to be living in when it comes to drafting a quarterback. Um... 
anything later and you're getting a little bit dicey. Um, but but still, I, I like that we got the tight end and kill all there. So overall, I think this team is fine. We're, we're ending up with a lot of the same guys on our teams, which is fine. Um, but but overall, I think drafting from the middle part of there, it, it didn't set us back too much. If you want to go quarterback early, that, that that is fine. But I do feel like there are maybe some better options for you um, if you just wait a little bit further down. So that is going to do it. Um, if you like this, make sure that you literally do that while watching. Uh, if you're listening, make sure you leave a review. Subscribe to the podcast or subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, I am at Primetime Klein on social media, and I will talk to all of you uh, as the fantasy previews continue and all the talk continues tomorrow. Have a great day, everybody.